to this panel debate on biodiversity and woody biomass, looking at how a bio-based economy contributes to biodiversity and sustainable forest management. I'm Siobhan Hall, I'm your moderator, and this event is an official part of the EU Green Week. Now, these are interesting times for anyone involved in biodiversity and woody biomass. The European Commission adopted an EU biodiversity strategy earlier this year, and next year it plans to update the EU Renewable Energy Directive and also adopt an EU forestry strategy. And of course, it's all part of this ambitious European Green Deal strategy to make the EU climate neutral by 2050. So there are lots of changes in the pipeline, and I'm delighted to welcome our four distinguished guests today to discuss the way forward. And in a moment, we're going to hear from them. So we have a lawmaker, we have an academic, and we have views from industry in Europe and the US. But before we get started, a couple of housekeeping points. So this event is being recorded, so and it will be available on the Bioenergy Europe website in a few days. So if your internet drops out, don't worry, you can still go back and watch it later. And the other thing is, you can ask questions. If you look on the right of your screen, there's a Q&A box. So please ask questions, and we will try to answer them if we can. So I can see that we have a lot of attendees signed up already. So we are going to get started. And I am going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, to say what they're what they do, why they're here, and, and give us three minutes, three minutes on uh, what their key messages are on this topic of biodiversity and sustainable forest management. And we're going to start with Elsie Katainen. So Elsie, you have the floor. Okay, you can hear me, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> hello. Yeah. hello, hello everyone. I'm Elsa Katainen, I'm a Finnish MEP. Uh, I'm in Renew Europe Group, uh, and I'm a Vice Chair of the ACRI, ACRI Committee at the moment. Um, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important panel today. Uh, as, as you said, uh, we are living very interesting moments in terms of biodiversity and sustainable forest management. The European Parliament will finally vote for the CAP reform this week and agri and with climate measures and biodiversity will be part of, of the package. Also in December, um, at the latest, we will vote for legislation for next two years, cap transitional regulation, which I have negotiated and which will be in force in January. Uh, here in second pillar commitments, we take a strong approach that there can't, can't be no backsliding in agri envy climate measures and forestry commitments are part of the package too. During uh, this autumn, we start building a position on biodiversity strategy, uh, which I will negotiate on behalf of my group, Renew Europe in Agri Committee. I see this as a continuation of the work on the report on EU forest strategy, where, in my view, Parliament was able to find a solid and balanced approach on the sustainable forest management and biodiversity too. Uh, for forest, it means that we recognize the multifunctional role of forests, environmental, economical and social aspects, and of course that we keep the forest policy in, in national competence um, and in accordance with the treaty. The side stream use of wood in renewable uh, energy plays an important role here as part of circular. Uh, bioeconomy. As a negotiator, my mission is to secure that the report on biodiversity will be in line with the approach taken in forest, EU forest strategy. And when it comes to Green Deal and the biodiversity strategy, I see there are some parts which need to be developed as the approach, especially on forest, is mainly only the environmental dimension. 
one of the key commitments laid down in Commission strategy is increasing the area of land protected to a minimum of 30% in the next 10 years, 10% of which should be strictly protected. What needs to be kept in mind is that member states vary significantly when it comes to nature. For example, in my home country, Finland, more than 75% uh, of land is co covered, covered with forest. Over half of the strictly pro protected forests in EU grows in Finland, and we have good voluntary systems in place with good results. So we need to make account different circumstances. Circumstances and focus rather in incentives than penalties and not build the strategy on restrictions. OK, and perfect. OK, one more, one more point, but we, we will we will be able to well, come back to this. Maybe one point, if you allow me. When it comes to forest management and Green Deal, I think that the most important proposal are yet to come. And here I need, for example, the update of LULUCEA uh, regulation and renewable energy directive. In this slide, these two strategies on biodiversity and forest plays a crucial role also from woody biomass point of view, which must maintain sustainable raw material in all uses. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. And we'll come back and discuss some of these issues in more depth okay. when we when we move on to the panel debate. So uh, thank you very much, Elsie. That was uh, an overview of some of the um, uh, issues that the policymakers are looking at at the moment. And now we turn to Khetian. Khetian, if you can introduce yourself and give us your key messages. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for uh, inviting me into this uh, Green Week panel. I'm Gerson Nabius. I'm a professor of European Forest Resources at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Um, I have quite a long background in, uh, in European scale forest resource analysis, and now I'm also coordinating lead author of the uh, IPCC Sixth Assessment Report in the mitigation chapter. Um, well, I, I did my PhD in Joensu. Mid Finland, so uh, I know a little bit also of the, the northern forestry, but certainly I've been around in many of the countries and seen a lot of the forest characteristics around Europe. And a huge variety and a huge diversity there is across Europe. And Elsie also already pointed a little bit at this that all these countries are, are different and regulations need to be, uh, well, as, as, as delicate as possible in, in trying to steer this. Um, what I certainly see, we, we do European scale forest resource analysis based on a very good relation with, with National Forest Inventory Institute. In most of the European countries, we have very detailed forest resource data from around Europe, which we hold in, in Wageningen. Based on that, we can make projections of the forest resources, forest management, addressing this multitude of, of functions that Elsie also pointed at. So it's it's wood provision, it's certainly also protection, it's, it's conservation as well. And with our modeling approaches, we can project the, if the future for a sink. Um, also wood provision, if we change our management now, it has an impact after 40, 50 years in terms of wood provision and biomass provision. And these analysis certainly show is that Europe's forests can fulfill this multitude of functions pretty well. So especially also biodiversity connection uh, protection next to also wood provision and biomass provision. And it does show that, and, and that's where the, the crux maybe is, is that you, it's not only about wood harvest and, and more harvest for the bio, my, biomass for bio, but that also means you need to invest in your forest management. That is especially also where, where an important message is, is that not only look at, at the harvest part and where things go right and wrong, maybe at the harvest part, but especially look at the investment as well. Okay, Enough. brilliant. So look at investment and bear in mind that these decisions taken now may have long-term impacts beyond the normal political cycle. Brilliant. So uh, we're going to move now to an industry view. And so, Julia, if you would like to take the floor. Uh, thank you, Shibon. Uh, so my name is uh, Julia Kanchan, and I am the policy director of uh, Bioenergy Europe. 
which is uh, the European Association representing uh, the EU bioenergy industry and its, uh, its value chain. Uh, so we see 2020 uh, as a key year uh, for, for our industry and in general for uh, the European policy agenda. Uh, because 2020 represents a bit the point of arrival of uh, the climate and energy legislation that we, we have now, but also the starting point of the new decade uh, with a complete shift of paradigm represented by the European Green Deal. And um, so for 2020, we see on one side um, the implementation of the Renewable Energy Directive sustainability uh, criteria, and this is especially high in our agenda. Uh, and this is also quite uh, key for uh, biodiversity preservation. And on the other side, we also are monitoring, of course, all the many strategic documents that the European Commission have been releasing uh, in the last few months. And the biodiversity um, strategy, in this sense, uh, has been a really important milestone for all the sector. Um, first of all, because bioenergy was uh, recognized by the European Commission uh, and acknowledge as um, a win-win solution for energy generation, if provided sustainably, of course. Uh, but also because this strategy has sparked uh, a debate uh, on the future of our sector and the practices that we, we will need to uh, implement in the next years. So uh, I will just introduce one of the main messages that we have, and is that um, as a sector, of course, we represent or uh, uh, we we depend on, on forestry and on the forest-based industry synergies. And we really believe that well-managed forests have the capacity uh, to remain a home for biodiversity in times of uh, um, increasing natural disturbances and, uh, and changing in, uh, in climate. And also that only resilient and healthy forests uh, can continue uh, delivering the multiple ecosystem services, including uh, the preservation of biodiversity, but also uh, providing uh, the, the economic services, so all the, the growth and, and the jobs that are um, dependent on, on this sector. Okay, thank you very much, Julia. So, essentially, if you take care of the forest, then you can take care of everything in the forest. And if you're doing that actively, then that's a good approach. So that was uh, the view from Europe and uh, we have an alternative, well we have another industry view and uh, Justin if you can take the floor. Thanks Siobhan, thanks uh, everybody for joining this um, webinar. Justin Tate and I need for sustainability for in, Viva. in Europe. In Viva is a uh, producer of wood pellets based in the US. Our production is all in the southeast US with customers in Europe and Asia. Um, I look after our work with existing customers, market, new markets, third party suppliers, and our engagement um, with the EU on all things sustainability. So, you know, as the world's largest producer and supplier of, of wood pellets uh, to reduce reliance on coal and help phase out coal and tackle climate change, we're deeply interested and concerned about the sustainable management and use of forests and, and hence our interest in this webinar today. This, which, you know, this sustainable management and use of those forests is integral to achieving the, the kind of climate targets we've already heard mentioned, uh, set out in the Green Deal and, and the ambition for net zero in 2050. And in the US, there's a long history of forest use and managing for long-term benefits, including for economic, social and environmental benefits. Um, and although there's some fundamental differences, I think, between the factors affecting forests, forests in the EU, EU uh, across the member states in the EU and the southeast US, uh, so for example, the prevalence of hurricanes and wildfires in, in the context of the US, there are some common goals that we certainly seek to achieve, such as protection and promotion of uh, biodiversity. And I think it's in this respect that Enviva's experience and practices are relevant to the debate in the EU on the role of the forest uh, products industry and biomass within it uh, in the debate around biodiversity, conservation and forest strategy that uh, are all part of this, this big mix of the, the, the Green Deal. And I, I can talk about some of those, the work that we do and, and experiences as we go through this webinar. I hope to be able to share some of that with you. Okay, 
Perfect. Brilliant. So like I said, we're going to come back to these themes in more detail, but um, that gives us an overview of the topics and the high level um, state of the, the debate. So I think you all mentioned EU policy there. Um, EU policy, sustainable forest management, biodiversity, these are the main themes. We're going to come back to sustainable forests and biodiversity. And now I want to dig in a bit deeper into the EU policy questions. So I have two questions for everyone on EU policy. The first one is, do you think the European Commission is on the right track when it comes to EU forest management and biodiversity policy? And a second question, are the new provisions in the latest EU Renewable Energy Directive enough to guarantee a sustainable biomass industry? And I'd like us to go around again. So we'll start with Elsie, go Elsie, Hetian, Julia, Justin. OK, so Elsie, um, do you have a view on the Commission's policies on forest management and biodiversity? Is it on the right track? Um, um, uh, uh, mm. Do you want me to come back to you? Do you want to have a think about it? And Do I'll you come have back? the question of using whole trees for bioenergy by Laura? Um, so one of the issues is, so yes, one of the issues is um, whether a whole tree should be used for bioenergy. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, if it's okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah for it. Yes, I, well, I can only say that it is not from <laughs> from this planet as there is uh, not any incentives to do do so that uh, when we are talking about the question of it, on using whole trees or for bioenergy. And it's, it is clear for me that the business of, uh, of course, uses all parts of wood for the best purposes. Um, I think that we need to see also the economical point of view. I see the importance of using the tree for the most coherent way, taking account the financial point of view from forest owner also. And like pointed in my opening remarks, sustainable forest management plays a crucial role on this issue. Biodiversity is in the core of these actions. It ensures that the conservation of biodiversity is encompassed with um, management activities. We need to remember that in some points, biodiversity also needs help from humans to maintain itself. Okay, so um, so that's a yeah. So we're we're saying again that um, managed forests gives an opportunity to also protect diversity because biodiversity because you are taking the trouble to actually um, help the help the ecosystem. So Khetian. Uh, I don't know if you so Elsie talked there about the whole trees. Do you do you have a views on the um on the general policy on forest management and biodiversity and the renewable energy directive? Yeah, what you you see is that the well, the EU is all often struggling with this uh with the topic on, on forests because there the EU doesn't have competence in, in the core of forests. And the EU has competence on climate, has competence on energy, uh, agriculture, even the trade of illegal wood, there's competence there. But on the topic forest, as such, not. So it's always a struggle to what degree the EU and, and the Commission can actually make a strong policy. And, and it, there's always a struggle between the member states and, and, uh, and the Commission between these. And that, that, that hampers also good and effective policies and, and uh, the, the countries themselves I, I think are also not they're also divided on this some want to keep forest policy making very much at the national level uh, where the EU only has some some extra uh, regulations maybe 
other countries are more open to, to have more forest competence at the EU. And I think also the countries are struggling with this. And this is hampering actually very strong and, and good uh, well, in, in investments or, or policies on the topic of forests that would actually help the countries in strengthening their forest management in the whole variety between the countries. And that is that is a, the, the challenge from, from mid-Sweden or mid-Finland down to mid-Italy. There's, there's an enormous variety of the functions that these forests have to fulfill. Uh, and that makes any regulation at the EU level very difficult. And so it's, it's pretty weak what is happening at the EU level on, on forests. Okay, so that was also coming back to the points that both you and Elsie were making earlier about the the uh, variety across member states and how yeah. um, it's difficult to find an EU approach which will be useful for each individual member state. Yeah. So, uh, Julia, do you have a view on how the EU policy on biodiversity and forest management is developing? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, you have asked a quite a complex question indeed, and uh, I will try to give you an answer both procedurally and content-wise. On mm -hmm. procedure, uh, when we are talking about the sustainability criteria, uh, we really think that we should give it a chance to, uh, to a strong enforcement to see how they work on the field. Because we have to keep in mind that uh, July 2021 is the date of implementation. Uh, there are strong hints from uh, European Commission strategies that uh, part of it might be revised. And this could happen, uh, but we, we want to make clear that um, we need to see how they work in practice before actually uh, judging them. Actually, the sustainability criteria uh, were the result of a very complex and democratic debate between uh, the co legislators in the European Union just in, 20, uh, in 2018, and uh, this process um, took some years. It is true now that uh, we are looking at a, um, at a different landscape. We, we need to uh, try and get uh, the 2020, uh, sorry, the 2050 climate neutrality goal uh, in mind. But still, uh, sustainability criteria will be implemented as, uh, as of uh, uh, some months' time. So I think that we should uh, give it a chance, uh, try with a very strong enforcement before uh, trying to, to revise them. As for the biodiversity and uh, the, uh, the relation with the sustainable forest management and the rest of the, the forest policy, again, uh, we need to keep in mind uh, all the different functions of the forest and uh, try to have the most coherent approach possible uh, also given the complexity of, of the different competence between uh, national level and European level. And I would like to also make a point on the world trees debate, because uh, the biodiversity strategy on one side recognized uh, the, the role of, of, bio, uh, of bioenergy as, um, as a win-win solution for energy generation. But on the other side, introduced a transformative approach uh, with the minimization of the use of wall trees. As much as this sounds awful, wall trees actually uh, is not a, de a definition, it's a completely arbitrary uh, designation. When we think about a wall tree, if we don't know forest, we might think about a high value uh, end use, but this is not necessarily the case. And indeed, bioenergy um, offers um, a market for utilizing those uh, lower grade products, such as for example, early thinnings, uh, providing an opportunity uh, to finance those sustainable forest management practices uh, for forest owners. And this is something that we should keep in mind uh, also when readjusting our policy framework. Okay, so um, I'm still, still, you still want to take time to see how sustainability criteria, the sustainability criteria will be enforced. And with the whole trees issue, you're saying there is um, perhaps a lack of understanding of how foresters actually use the trees and how they get the benefits um, out of it. Correct. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So, Justin, the view from the US. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think you know, from a sort of an outsider's point of view, in a sense of, of being a US company, but also 
I'm sitting in the UK, so we're soon to be very much out of the EU, sadly. Um, but I, I think, you know, broadly uh, thinking about the, the direction of the Green Deal and, and the EU Commission being on the right track in terms of forest management and biodiversity, I'd say yes, uh, in the sense that it, you know, there is a recognition of the multiple roles that forests play, both in terms of you know, for society, for the environment, from livelihoods to recreation to carbon sequestration and storage. I think, as Julia has pointed out uh, a couple of times, RED2 recognises the role that biomass has to play uh, in a world where we need to rapidly reduce uh, a reliance on fossil fuels to help tackle climate change. So I think, you know, from that point of view, then I, I think it is on the, ra- on the right track. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of RED2, is it sufficient to guarantee sustainable bi- a sustainable biomass industry? Again, I, I would say yes. Um, you, you just pointed out that the kind of lengthy process that we went through to get to a point of having RED2 and the sustainability criteria. Um, it is, of course, coupled with the ability of member states to effectively implement um, RED2, um, and we're kind of still waiting for that implementation guidance to, to be finalised. Um, and it's also you know, the, the, the ability of those of certification schemes like the Sustainable Biomass Programme to be a, a route to demonstrate compliance with RED2. Um, so, yes, I certainly think that they are a sufficient guarantee coupled with those things too, and coupled with uh, responsible sourcing practices of biomass producers themselves when it comes to biomass um, and, you know, and being transparent about what those uh, policies are and, and how sourcing operations work. We covered a couple of times the whole trees issue, and, uh, and I think on, on there again, as has been mentioned, it mentioned, it's kind of critical to understand that that wood fibre, in terms of value, as opposed to the physical attributes um, of size and diameter. Um, so in, in in the US and many markets, for example, the sorting and harvesting of wood according to its value is how markets have emerged, and and well before the advent of biomass. Uh, so, and if they're allowed to operate efficiently in that way, it will continue to ensure that wood fibre flows to the highest and best end use first before, you know, and, and you'll see that cascading, that natural economic cascading principle means that biomass is using uh, the much lower value um, materials. And so it, we need to think about that kind of question in terms of value as opposed to is it is it a whole tree, which is, as Julia said, is a fairly meaningless term in forestry in the first place. Okay. Okay, well, I think that's um, that that's uh, very very clear. If we stick with the um, the European Green Deal and, and policy and so on, and and I think several of you mentioned more than one policy measure when you were talking about your your responses. So we know that the Commission has this European Green Deal strategy. It's to make the EU climate neutral by 2050. It's to do that uh, whilst having a green recovery and whilst protecting biodiversity. So there are various um, different goals that will all have to be achieved, you know, that it won't be a success and, and unless it manages to do all of these, uh, manages to achieve all of these different goals. Um, if we go around again, do you see that policymakers are bearing that in mind when they're approaching all these different strands because I think Elsie you mentioned something you mentioned at the beginning so you have cap policy you have biodiversity you have no competence on forests like they don't have competence on forests but they do have competence on sustainability so how do you see it how how do you see they're doing and and how do you see it developing yes thank you I can see the importance of green deal as an umbrella program but as I have seen the debate in different committees in, in Parliament, I feel that, like we say in Finland, we don't always see the forest as a whole, but only the trees. Uh, what we need next is a very careful impact assessment before each legislative proposal. We have, we have to keep in mind that Green Deal was published only in uh, 100 days and it is not legislative act. When it comes to, to climate law uh, and net emissions uh, from forestry perspective, it is most important that we have national targets, that there are no free movers uh, 
uh, and that the forests of the country as a sink will not be used as comp compensation to the emissions of other countries. Okay, so I can see that's particularly relevant to Finland and as you were saying that there's so much more forest in Finland than in than in other countries. So, uh, Chetian, how do you see this ability to manage all these different objectives successfully? Yeah, that's that's indeed a challenge between on the one hand uh, wanting higher uh, goals for renewable energy, partly than wood based, which uh, to to a certain extent is certainly nothing wrong with. Um, and then also wanting to maintain a sink and wanting to conserve biodiversity that puts of course a lot of pressure on on uh, on, on on juggling all these different aims and in the end well, coming back to that the, the, the member states will have to be will have to solve that that juggling and, and some will put more emphasis on on a bioeconomy and others will, may put more emphasis on biodiversity conservation, and then I think you can solve this at the EU scale if you if you, if you allow for some spatial uh, distribution of the functions and some where some put a bit more emphasis on conservation and others a bit more emphasis on the bioeconomy, and then then you can solve that. You cannot solve that by by mixing all those goals in the same forest and the same degrees for all the member states. That's that's going to be a be a nightmare, and uh, but of course you we do see that the, the forest sink is declining a little bit. That's partly because of aging of the forest, and well, since the economic recession, harvest has increased a bit, with, with something like six or seven percent. Of course, that affects the sink in the forest, and so you you, you need to invest. In forest, and uh, we all see in Central Europe how Norway spruce is suffering under the the droughts of the last two or three years. Massive mortality in the Norway spruce forest. These forests need to be regenerated, probably more in in a wider variety of species, uh, probably more mixed also with deciduous forest. That's the only way to adapt these resources as well to climate change, and then then you. You improve biodiversity and in the end uh, also provide uh, renewable resources. Okay, so actually, if um, so, again, that was a call for flexibility and uh, to allow member states some discretion in how they manage the different uh, natural resources because they're all different. Um, if you allow me, Julia and Justin, if we can move on because I know that Elsie has to has to go. Um, in a few minutes, and I have another question that's specifically for Elsie, so I'd like to put that to her, and we can always come back um, to you a bit later if you have views on this as well. So, Elsie, um, you were talking earlier about your work on the Agricultural Agriculture Committee, and um, can you, can you just tell us very briefly how you see the Common Agricultural Policy contributing to biodiversity, and and how those how those how it will work with EU goals to safeguard rural communities and rural development. Yes, thank you for your questions. I think that in in Parliament uh, abroad for the agri envy climate measures, we have a quite strong position to take care of nature and biodiversity. I don't see this as a bad thing, but we need to remember a couple of things. Of course, firstly, uh, we need to underline uh, that one size doesn't fit for all. I see that CAP can deliver a lot of benefits on the side of biodiversity. Member states need to have different tools for their own needs to enhance biodiversity. So we have to have enough flexibility, for example, in the GAECs and I'm content that we had good results there in negotiations. Um, the second point is that we should rather give carrot than stick for farmers, forest owners and other actors. When we encourage to choose actions good for the environment, we will get them on the board. Uh, the mandatory action are never the best solution on this. So it is important that this approach will be taken, for example, in the eco-schemes, once these will be implemented. 
Um, I see that we can't separate taking care of biodiversity and safeguarding the rural communities and rural development. Uh, those two always will work hand in hand and support each other a lot. Uh, when we have lively rural communities, we will also have well-managed areas from where biodiversity will benefit. Okay, so it's about winning the hearts and minds of people involved that they do it because they think it's a good idea themselves and not because someone else is telling them it's a good idea. That they see the value of it themselves. Yeah, okay. So um, we have a question from the audience that I want to include in, in this session because uh, you were talking, several of you were talking earlier about the uh, sustainability proposals, or rather you're talking about the sustainability of biomass. So um, do you see that the European Commission is going to bring revised proposals you were talking about this earlier about the about the whole trees question, but do you think the European Commission is going to take a position on the whole trees question? And do you do you see that if there is do you see political support in either the the member states or in the Parliament for um, changing the sustainability pro uh, proposals? Elsie, do you have a view on that? Uh, yeah, question. I hope not. I don't believe that there will be a big support for that. Support for whole, whole wood systems. I'm okay, those, I love that. Short and clear. Good. <laughs> yeah. um, um, Khatian, do you have a view? Yep. Uh, well, I, I think in practice that will not work. That's not workable. You cannot. You will almost have to put a, a public officer next to every tree. Yeah, this is. You know, if we go into that level of detail, of should a thick, well, a whole tree might be just twenty centimeters, but a branch can also be twenty centimeters. You know, this, this this becomes ridiculous if you start making regulations uh, into that level of detail. That's it. No, I, I don't think, and, and earlier speakers mentioned this, how, how the wood market makes sure that the good qualities go to the sawmill and the low qualities can go to a, to paper or a pallet uh, factory. Usually the market takes care of that very well. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a theme developing, but let's go around anyway so everyone gets to say their piece. So, uh, Julia, what do you think? Oh. Um, so hold on one second. I think Elsie has to go. Is that right? Are you going? Okay, so thank you very much, yeah. Elsie, for joining thank us. You. And, thank you so much. And thank you. Um, take care. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you for your input. Bye bye. 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 Uh, so, Julia. Yeah, uh, so just uh, two uh, short considerations also on what uh, Hert Jan has, has just said. Uh, so, first of all, um, I really believe that uh, tree diameter is not the only prescription to its end use. Uh, and, and by this, I mean that uh, when we look at uh, uh, a saw log, for example, uh, so a, a basically a log that is suitable for, uh, for sewing into, into lumber and be processed in a sawmill, this is not chosen solely on its size and diameter. And actually, uh, its quality is uh, is really determined by the absence of, of faults. So, uh, as, as Gertiane said, <laughs> this is really not workable. So, we're not only talking about diameter, we're also talking about uh, quality shape and, and whether, for example, uh, the tree was in, infested by, uh, by bark beetle or, or other uh, pest, uh, it was damaged by a storm or other sort of uh, uh, natural disturbances that are becoming more and more uh, frequent in, in the European and, and world uh, landscape, really. So uh, this is one point that I wanted to make. And the second one is that um, we will see, uh, I, I, in, I really believe that uh, there is a long way to go uh, for the next six months. We know that the European Commission will reopen the, the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, but uh, member states and the European Commission is still discussing how, uh, so whether to to only 
um, you know, uh, change uh, basically the targets or looking at a more holistic view. So we don't know yet whether this uh, sort of uh, new sustainability requirements will be uh, introduced in the next six months time. Okay, and Justin? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't know whether there will or won't be um, the use of the term, but I, I think it, it, we're definitely seeing a debate about it and an ongoing debate. And in some senses, it's useful to have that, if only to to address the points that people are raising about the. You know, it's not a workable solution to or a term to use. It's not, it doesn't make sense as a term. And as we talked about earlier on, it, it, it's kind of critical to understand wood fibre in terms of its value as opposed to the physical attributes like size and diameter. Um, and then you come back to the question of, you know, how does the wood, wood market work and how does the forest products industry work and where do those wood flows occur? Uh, it makes much more sense to have that as a conversation. And, and this is, is prompting that, I think. Um, so for that sense, I think it's a good thing. Um, uh, but we certainly don't it's not useful to have that terminology in, in, in terms of legislation. It, it actually is more like to have negative consequences than positive ones. I think that's um, so that's an interesting point. This is often how European policy gets made is someone proposes something that gives everyone an opportunity to say why it won't work as it's originally proposed. And then you work through to something that perhaps may work. That's not always the case, but uh, we will we will see. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes, so uh, I wondered if um, if Julia, the earlier question we had about um, trying to find consistency in the various policy objectives of protecting biodiversity whilst also having a green recovery, whilst also having uh, being climate neutral by 2050. Do you see that as do you see particular challenges in achieving that? Well, yeah, this is uh, this is a really challenging balance uh, balance to, to to achieve, and I think that we will see uh, most of the pieces of the puzzle coming together um, in the second half of next year. Uh, so far, we have seen many strategies. Uh, some of them were not completely coherent in terms of uh, of objectives. On one side, having um, the need to still grow and doing so sustainably, and on the other side, um, uh, privileging a certain sort of uh, environmental angle um, and, uh, and underlining uh, certain priorities. I think that um, in terms of understanding whether this balance will be achieved or not, uh, one of the most important pieces of legislation that we should uh, look from close and, and really monitor in the next couple of months is um, the Sustainable Finance Taxonomy uh, Delegated Act. So the Commission and the Technical Expert Group has been working on this uh, for quite some months now. And the first drafts that uh, came out from the Technical Expert Group, so a group appointed by uh, the European Commission to assist them uh, to create a, uh, a set of uh, uh, sustainability requirements to define those economic activity that should be eligible for this kind of uh, green investments. And we've seen that in the first drafts, um, there was a bit of a, of a gap between the existing legislation, the existing methodologies to define what is sustainable and what should be, for example, renewable, uh, like uh, in our case, the sector of, uh, of, of bioenergy, and the actual requirements that were in the first drafts of, uh, of this report that sometimes were um, a bit, I would say, far from a field re reality and possibility of, uh, of implementation. So in the next couple of weeks, I think we will see uh, the first delegated act, so the first draft, mm -hmm. and we will see from there whether this need of, uh, of striking a balance and getting a coherent approach uh, will be really um, sort of uh, important and achieved by the European Commission. So that will be the first step. And then next year, we will really see how these different pieces of the puzzle will come together. OK, so that's interesting, to, something to watch out for there in the next couple of weeks. Um, I know because I'm sure people read sustainable finance taxonomy and they think and, and they're not thinking that's going to be a really interesting read, but it, it's going to be very significant, isn't it? Um, Absolutely. And then just 
Yeah, and then Justin, do you have a just a short comment, perhaps on on? Yeah, on just, uh, yeah. I mean, I think the ambition of the the Green Deal is absolutely right. How to get there is going to is already creating a lot of debate. And for me, I think without you, know, I agree with what Julia was saying about the the SFI, and, and certainly that would have been an example I would use because what we need to see is consistency in the criteria. Um, you know, if, you know, and I'm interested particularly in, in consistency around uh, woody biomass and the criteria we apply to that, um, because that's important for markets, for member states, and for users that they are given clear signals about what is deemed to be sustainable and acceptable under various parts of the Green Deal and EU initiatives, um, and, and that sort of quite and the, to the, to achieve net zero. So it, it, having inconsistencies does not send clear signals. To, to those thinking about using biomass, to those who are concerned and interested in the sustainable, what counts as good and bad biomass. So, you know, an example I would point to is the one that Judith already raised with the sustainable finance taxonomy. Um, so, you know, to me, that's what we need is that consistency between those criteria. Having inconsistencies is, is a dangerous thing and not helpful for any any uh, of these initiatives on the Green Deal. Okay, well, that's uh, very clearly stated as well. Um, it's the work on the on the Green Deal strategy. I mean, it's just um, it's just enormous, isn't it? The amount of work that the Commission is now, the amount of legislation the Commission is um, reopening to achieve the Green Deal is just most that I've ever seen, and I've been looking at this for a long time. So I'm going to pause on um, EU policy for the moment and we're going to get stuck into the other main themes, which is sustainable forest management and biodiversity. So we've obviously touched on these so far, but I'm going to go a bit deeper. And the question is, how does the, how does the biomass and forest products industry protect and promote biodiversity and conservation? And there are people who might argue you should just leave the forests as forests and not touch them. So is managing the forest a more effective way to maintain and improve biodiversity? Is using biomass compatible with having an ecologically sound green recovery as we head to this 2050 net zero climate neutral future? Um, Julia, are you happy to take that? Yeah, absolutely. So I will try to be concise. I would, to answer to this question, I would look at, uh, um, again, uh, three elements that are actually part of uh, natural disturbances in the forest at the moment. So, for example, pest management, uh, forest fire, increasing forest fires, and uh, windstorms. So if we want uh, to keep uh, the forest in Europe and elsewhere resilient and healthy, um, and continue also to deliver those ecosystem services, uh, including biodiversity. Uh, sustainable forest management is a sine qua non, so we cannot do without. Um, the idea that there is uh, a niche of the market that will actually add or give any uh, economic viability of certain degraded woods uh, and, um, for example, enable um, sanitary cuttings where they are needed and uh, reuse those material or wood damaged by by fires for example or storms. Uh, these are services that are given directly by uh, by the, the bioenergy sector today um, and they are clearly helping uh, keeping the forest environment healthy and resilient. So in this sense uh, we can say that there is a really positive, there can be a positive and virtual circle between biodiversity preservation and uh, the, the bioenergy sector. So giving economic viability to, to certain material is actually very important, uh, for especially for now and the future. So. Okay, so that's similar to Elsie's point earlier that if you make it in people's interest to look after the forest well, they will look after the forest well, and that helps with looking after the biodiversity. Um, and and Justin, do you have a view on this? On yeah, um, and again, thinking about it from um, a kind of a US perspective and how that translates. Um, 
you know, at a fundamental level, the existence of a, a healthy forest products market, including biomass, um, helps keep forests as forests, certainly in the context of somewhere like the southeast US, where which is dominated by private land ownership. So having a market for products means those forests stay as forests, and actually data shows increase the forest inventory uh, because you have growing markets, strong markets, has, has led to increased forest inventory in somewhere like the southeast US. But I think within that context, you know, and, and the, the sustainable forest management plays a key role uh, and helps provide habitat uh, types for plant and wildlife species. Um, so, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, they go hand in hand. I think you can have good sustainable forest management um, and that provides an opportunity um, to keep forests as forests and also to, to pro promote and protect biodiversity and conservation efforts. And I think, you know, down to the level of an individual biomass producer like Enviva, you know, we, we're able to invest in, in conservation measures. We have a, uh, a forest conservation fund that's invested over 10 million pounds in, in, in over 10 years will be. And that's that's to conserve specific habitats. But I think more interestingly as well, it, it, this kind of industry provides opportunities for restoration. So we work very closely with uh, an organization called the Longleaf Alliance which is to, it works to reestablish longleaf pine um, in, in many areas of the southeast US. And the kind of opportunities that brings to, to those organizations when there's a biomass uh, producer um, in, in the same region where they want to do that is that it makes it much more, it, it makes it, it helps drive that restoration because part of that restoration is about clearing out hardwood scrubby understories to allow for more open canopies to allow for regeneration of long leaf pine now to the before biomass there was no market for that that material biomass provides a market for that material so we have a nice example of, of, of restoration which is bringing back habitats but it's also providing actually a source of you know, use for that material that was it was otherwise not going to be harvested or used at all. So it, there's some, some nice synergies that we can see there. And I think there are probably other examples we can point to uh, within a, a context of, of the EU too, that where these things can go hand in hand. And I think that's where we look for the, the kind of win-win areas. Um, so, I, you know, I think that is possible to do. And I think that to biomass as, a, as an industry has a role to play within the wider forest products industry too, when it comes to um, promoting and protecting um, biodiversity. Okay, but, well, I think that, that brings us uh, nicely to um, an audience question, or a question from the audience that we had, which was um, that it's, the question is that perhaps their society generally, or people who live in towns and cities, or um, other people who aren't so close to the forest, see people cutting down trees and they go well how can this be how how, how is this sustainable so it appears there's a there's a perception there's a perception issue so uh we'll start with Katia because you haven't had a chance to speak uh, so much um but do you think this sort of perception that the way forests are managed is um is unsustainable is a problem and is there some way to address that to change those perceptions the, that is indeed an enormous challenge that that we face, and I'm not only meaning the the forest forest industry and the forest managers, but certainly also NGOs. I think have a role to play in this. Is that indeed while people say that sort of remarks, you know, you should not cut down trees. At that moment, they may be sitting on a wooden chair, holding a piece of paper in their hands, and uh, and they've just used toilet paper and. You know these hundreds of products coming out of the forest, and at the same time they say that trees cannot be cut down, and and that's indeed that's an enormous challenge. Also for the agricultural sector, faces basically the same problem. Um, but I I certainly see that uh, well you you all know the, the the global population projection says that we will soon be with nine billion people in the world and at the same time we're not we shouldn't use so much fossil carbon in the future anymore and that that basically means that we will need much more renewable carbon in the future so that is the the the, the challenge that we we have to explain that to the public and, and we should continuously explain that to the public 
and the NGOs also have a responsibility here to clearly make a distinction to what, what sometimes indeed things do go wrong in terms of forest management. There are places in the world where things really go wrong and it should, we should be all be very specific when do things go wrong and at which locations are things going much better. And uh, we, we really have to distinguish that and have, have a balanced uh, discussion in, in that. But I also see the enormous challenge to, to actually do that. It's, uh, it's not easy in an urbanized society. Okay, so yes, another challenge ahead for everyone yep. working in on the European Green Deal and all the aspects of yep. it. I want to yep. go to um, um, another question because which is also related, uh, which is um, we'll see people will question whether it's sustainable to use imported woody biomass in Europe. So how how do you guarantee that? woody biomass, that all woody biomass is sustainably sourced and protects diversity, biodiversity at the same time. Um, is that something that Justin, how do, you, how do you reassure people that everything is sustainably sourced? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of things, that, which includes in the context of discussions we're having today, is being able to demonstrate that the way that biomass is sourced and produced is in line with things like the renewable energy directive uh, it, or if it's in you know national legislation for example in the uk conforms with the uk land criteria part of that is is having certification in place um, for the production of that biomass but i think another really important part of that is also individual biomass producers approaches to responsible sourcing and their transparency uh, around that sourcing. So, for example, as in Viva, we are, have a, a very open and publicly available uh, data and, and website that shows that data on, on where our fiber comes from. And you can you can go in and look at that and look at it down to the level of the harvest tract and see what in Viva is sourced from that tract and you know, where that tract is and, and the kind of mixtures between hardwoods and softwoods. So, I think there's a combination of things that that. That, that answer that question in terms of ensuring that sustainability, and it shouldn't just be a reliance on the fact. Well, we have a cert we have a certificate. I don't think that's enough. I think you know businesses need to do more. They need to be able to demonstrate what they need to they do. They need to be transparent about what they do, um, and to be open to engage in conversations about what they do. And that's that's very much what we aim to do, uh, as in Viva, and you know I'm more than happy to have those conversations. Uh, with, with whoever's interested and, and do that quite a lot. And that's my role too, is to, to engage in those kind of conversations and explain what we do uh, and why we do believe it is the same and why imported biomass does make sense in, in the context of um, the ambitions in the European Union and the member states there. Okay, so you're saying that, you know, the companies themselves have a role to play in in being transparent in, in showing what their data is so that people don't think that something is being hidden away because there's something bad about it. Um, uh, we have some more questions and I'm aware of the time passing away. So um, we have actually, so there is an audience question. I think this is for Khatian uh, specifically. The question is, um, what forest management is best to address climate change? So is it best to have no harvest no harvest to increase the carbon stock or to have an active management to optimize, well, it says optimize carbon production. I'm not sure if I understood that question correctly, but perhaps you do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm so, sorry for the noise in the background. I live in the rural areas and a lot of tractors passing by here with truckloads with full of potatoes. So <laughs> I also need to, to happen the harvest. Um, yeah, what is the best? What is the optimal? We receive that question quite often, I must say. And um, you know, e even in the, in the Netherlands, we have small, strict reserves since the early 80s. Uh, so there, there are very small 50, 60 hectare reserves, and uh, well, we we monitor them. And of course, these forests for the last 40, 50 years, they have built up really large amounts of of carbon in the forest. They're still growing vigorously after 50 years. They're still building up carbon. 
no signs of large scale uh, mortality in there. So that is that is an option to do that if the forest owner he or she is interested in that. That is certainly an option. It, in in some forms of biodiversity, it will also help to have strict reserves. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can do that everywhere or that you just should do that everywhere. You because by establishing reserves, and if we want to maintain the same amount of renewable resources, that means you put your pressure on the forest somewhere else. And that's the, the, the again, this, this balancing of functions that you have to do. And, and so I tend to say there is not really an optimal management. You can, strict reserves is an option for the owner if he or she wants to do that but also managing actively, producing wood products, uh, producing partly also biomass for bioenergy is certainly also an option and will also be needed. And, and, and both have a, have a very beneficial carbon balance where the wood products, of course, substitute steel and aluminium, etc. That's, I think, the, the story we, we will be familiar with. Okay, so again, it comes back to the earlier it ideas. Is, of... is, is not always a simple yes or no. <laughs> yeah. And and comes back to the earlier discussions about how you know different forests are used for different things in different countries, and and so you have to allow for the um, specific uh, a word I can never say the specifics of different uh, situations. Yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you, thank you, Hesian. Um Now sticking on the the topic of uh, sustainability, there are initiatives like the forest should should. Stewardship Council and the program for the endorsement of forest certification. So, are these initiatives are they enough to ensure sustainability in forest resources? Julia, Julia, do you have a view on that? Well, I think that uh, first of all we should acknowledge the benefit uh, of uh, of having uh, so uh, long-lasting uh, scheme in place uh, in Europe. Uh, this scheme, first of all, have also the benefit of building on uh, field experience and uh, being, uh, I would say, uh, geographically uh, in in being present all over all over Europe. When we look at uh, the amount of forests that in Europe are certified at the moment, uh, this is a, certainly a big amount. Uh, we are talking about around uh, uh, 60 percent. Uh, counting the two certifications, so this is also uh, something very important. And also we need to take into account that when a forest is not certified, FSC or PFC, that doesn't mean that it's not managed sustainably. Uh, we need to look at the structure of forests uh, in Europe. In certain cases, uh, we have uh, very uh, small holdings that do not have um, the, the means, the interest, uh, to, to basically be certified and yet are uh, using sustainable practices. Uh, so absolutely these are two chief and very important instruments in Europe to ensure sustainability of, uh, of biomass uh, regardless of, uh, of the end use because these are very, um, very much used in the, in the products market. Um, but at the end of the day, we need to keep in mind that uh, when a forest is not certified, that does not equal with non-sustainability. And this is something important because we see more and more also in the, in the media and in G NGOs arguments building up on the fact that uh, certification uh, is, the, is the key and, and the only way to say that, uh, that something is done well and sustainably. This is certainly a very nice and good step. Uh, to, to also guarantee transparency to the, to the consumer and to the final users. But sometimes that does just not happen and does not correspond to non-sustainability uh, de facto. So just then a follow up on that, if it's not possible to certify the forest for, for whatever reason, um, do, you have an, do you have ideas for what could be done to reassure people that it is sustainably managed if certification isn't possible? Yeah, I think I go back to what I said before. It's about being able to demonstrate what does happen at the forest sourcing level. Um, and you, and certification is not always a case of it, it is or it isn't possible. There's, a, there's a, an economic question there for a small landowner of whether it's viable um, from a point of view. 
Um, so I think Judah's point that just because it's not certified doesn't mean it's not managed sustainably. And, and, and that's certainly the case in many places around the world. Forests are still managed sustainably just because they're not certified to FSC or PSC doesn't mean that's not the case. Um, but I think there are other ways to demonstrate that. And I, again, from a biomass producer point of view, I think that is about transparency uh, and um, you know being transparent about what your responsible sourcing policy is, what the elements of sustainable forest management within that are, what kind of measures you have in place to protect uh, HCBs, high conservation value areas, um, and, and how you carry out those kind of assessments when you're looking at sourcing a particular tract. You know, what questions are you asking? What are you looking for? What characteristics mean that it is a, an HCB that which precludes sourcing from those tracts? So I think there's lots of things that, around that kind of transparent uh, you know, transparency of what you do as a biomass producer uh, goes alongside certification. And as I said, personally, certification is not enough necessarily. It's not the be all and end all. There are lots of other things I think sit alongside certification to be able to to demonstrate and talk about the sustainability of, of forest resources and how they're used. Okay, well that seems uh, very, very clear. And uh, we'll move on to the next question, which is about afforestation. So the question, and this is an audience question, a question from the audience. Um, what is the most effective use of afforestation? So how at EU level can you make the best use of afforestation? Who would like to take that? We can, let's do some visual. Who would like to take that question? Raise your hand if you'd like to take that question. Can I? Uh, Yay, <laughs> Very briefly, I may, I'll also leave room for Julia. Uh, yeah, you now see that even afforestation becomes uh, controversial uh, in the EU. It's one of Timmermans' uh, plans for three billion trees, uh, which maybe comes out to three million hectares per year extra. I, I do think. It is a it is one part of the solution, and that certainly should should remain one aspect of the green deal. It it can be a combination again of of some areas more plantation oriented, other areas could be more on restoration oriented, and then we can really find the, the best spots without taking. Of course, you don't want to take the best agricultural soils for that, but the EU has a lot of marginal lands, and, and uh, so that this. This can be uh, done in, in a very effective way in, in uh, really looking at, at where and, and how to do that. Uh, also, partly as cooling of cities around cities, that sort of combinations is really, uh, really needed. OK, if anyone else wants to say, they can say something, but it has to be very brief because we're coming to the end of the session. So, oh, you both want to. OK, Julia, go for it. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll keep it in 30 seconds, so I agree completely with what uh, Harry Yemna said, but I would also build up on, on the question. So we're talking about uh, um, several billion trees, and uh, that is certainly important and we support it. But we need to keep in mind that, um, that finance will need to be mobilized also to keep uh, this new afforested area healthy. And uh, when we're talking about planting trees, it's not an action that takes five minutes. It's an action that takes years, uh, decades, because we need to ensure that the health of the forest is there for a long time. So no financing for three billion trees, and then we turn our back on that and we go away. But that needs to be a long-term project with a lot of uh, financing and mobilization of a workforce also for this kind of long-term rural development. Okay, and Justin? Yeah, I mean, just to echo, I think what Jan was saying is, yes, I think, uh, and, and Julia, afforestation can absolutely be a good thing, but you've got to think about not just planting them, but what are they going to be used for? Are they going to set some aside for recreation, some aside for ecosystems, some aside for production? And I think the experience that we've talked about from, this, from the US, for example, shows that a working forest or a working forest landscape is helping to keep that forest as forest, but actually increasing inventory too. So afforestation programs that have a market for the product that's that's coming out of those forests or can partly come out of that afforestation is an important piece, but actually making that as a policy workable, viable, and, and, and make sense in the long term. Okay, so it comes back again to the uh, the idea that essentially planting a tree is a long term is a long term decision, and you want to think about what happens over the life, lifetime of that uh, of the tree. So we are coming to, we only have five minutes left. We are coming to the end of the session. 
Um, it's been a very interesting discussion so far. And as is the um, norm in these kind of events, I'm going to press you to come up with one key message that you would have for the European Commission um, policymakers on what on the role of biomass in ensuring biodiversity and sustainable forest management. So one message. So very very um, precise. So we'll start. We'll go Khatian, Julia, and then Justin. Khatian, one message. Very precise. Bring out your in eight Dutchness. Very precise. Very direct. <laughs> oh. Uh... Yes, uh, I'd say uh, this is a bit uh, difficult, but uh, yes, this is part of, of preserving also biomass for bioengineering is also part of preserving biodiversity. And it can be this trigger for in incentivizing and investing in the long term. And that is what is needed in the EU. Investing in the long term. OK. Yeah. Julia. Hold on. You need to unmute you. So uh, I would say keep an holistic view on on the um, on the policy making. So uh, on one side, um, all the forest function count, uh, environmental, social, and economic objectives. For bioenergy, that will be needed in order to uh, to get right uh, the transition and get to climate neutrality by 2050. And at the same time, um, remind the role of the people, the jobs in uh, in rural areas. So this is okay. You've managed to get two messages in there. Well done, uh, Justin. I love that. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to see cards. So I think you, from a biomass producer specific point of view, our experience shows that biomass certainly does have a role to play, and for providing markets for that low value material, but can be done in a way that uh, addresses biodiversity concerns uh, and is an opportunity in some instances for for, for restoration too and i think what that means for, for the eu that's a really important element of the road to achieving that 2050 target um, as just described by julia chamber the role bioenergy has to play in that, an essential role okay okay so there we have it investing long term rural jobs holistic view and that bioenergy gives people an economic incentive to preserve biodiversity and um, manage the forest sustainably. So um, I just want to thank thank Julia, Justin and Khatian and Elsie who's left. I want to thank you all for your insights today. Uh, we're coming up to the end of the time. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the recording will be available on the Bioenergy Europe website in a few days if you want to go back and look at it again and that um, there will be another event the European Bioenergy Future Summit hosted by Bioenergy Europe on the 18th to 20th of November I'm guessing that's also must be an online event not if it's an online event yes it's an online event of course it's an online event because we live in strange times so I just want to thank everyone again for joining us and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.